afternoon, everyone, unless it's morning or night where you're listening to this. I'm Caleb Giddings from Gunnuts Media, and this is kind of a resurrection of the old Gunnuts Radio podcast that I did, partly because I like talking to people and partly because it's coronavirus and we can't go outside and shoot guns right now, which is really depressing for a lot of us. And I decided for the first guest on the Resurrected podcast to bring on Matt Little, who is a former U.S. Army Special Operations, former Chicago SWAT, uh, currently an STI brand ambassador, uh, firearms instructor, high-level competition shooter. And I think, I think Matt, I covered all the bases there. Did I miss anything? Uh, that's the high points for sure. <laughs> no, it's... Uh... That pretty much sums it up, I guess. I retired from the police department about a year ago. I retired from 20th Special Forces Group in the National Guard a couple years before that. And I started up a, a training business and I do a lot of USPSA and IDPA and go around and hang out with the guys that I like to hang out with doing the stuff I like to do on the range. That's a pretty good life, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and one of the things also that I forgot to mention about Matt is he's also into fitness, which is something that will come up later in this podcast that I wanted to talk about. But the reason I wanted to have you on uh, is you really have one of the you're one of very few people in the industry who has a background where you can speak to shooting a gun under competition stress shooting a gun under life and death stress, training with a gun, and all of these other things. And this was kind of born out of a conversation and a theory that I'd had that shooting is shooting, and it doesn't matter where you're shooting, whether I'm standing on the range or I'm shooting a match or I'm in a gunfight, the mechanical act, and I have to be very precise with this language, the mechanical act of shooting doesn't change. The only thing that changes are the environmental factors around you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, actually. It's for some reason, you know, we throw around the word tactics and tactical all the time, right? And people seem to think that that somehow changes the way the body performs, the way the mind performs. It doesn't. I mean, it's still an athletic skill. It's still a mental and a physical skill. How you apply it may be different, but the actual act itself does not change. And one of the frustrating things to me is despite the popularity of like the phrase tactical athlete, most people who are tactical athletes aren't training like athletes train. That's a very good point. I never thought of that, but yeah, that's absolutely a very good point because an athlete, you know, if you look at uh, an Olympic level runner, they are not training to do things that are superfluous to Olympic level running. You know, their training is extremely tightly focused on that. And then you get these tactical athletes and uh, I'm not, I'm not talking crap about any of these guys. Most of these guys are very high level performers in whatever it is they're doing, but applying that phrase athlete to more of a broader scope of training isn't really, I don't think it's really appropriate and it kind of gives you the wrong idea of how to train. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we do ourselves some disservices like in the military and law enforcement community when it comes to training. And there are a few things that, uh, like I love kind of skewering some of the old tropes, some of the old cliches, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the ones that I love kind of uh, getting people wound up about is train like you fight, because that's really not the best way to train for a fight. So take an example, right? Everybody okay. loves, everybody on SWAT teams loves the football analogy. They, they right. love like they love that analogy, right? So there is no high level football team that does nothing but scrimmage and full pads every practice. No, they really that would, don't. That would be training like you fight. Interesting. I like and I like that. And that make and when you apply that to something that everybody understands, it makes perfect sense. There are no but professional baseball teams that have their practice sessions consist of playing nine innings against each other. Yep. You know, yep. um, UFC fighters, you don't do nothing but spar. No. Um, as a matter of fact, I remember Tony Ferguson, who's one of my favorite fighters. Uh, and for people who haven't uh, interacted with me before, uh, in addition to liking guns, I am a degenerate fan of mixed martial arts. Uh, Tony Ferguson is one of my favorite fighters. And before he fought uh, Poirier, I believe it was, he mentioned he didn't spar at all in that training camp. And he beat the brakes off Poirier. That was a hell of a fight. But, and that's a perfect example. You don't see high level mixed martial artists going out and just banging, having, you know, yeah. 
25 minute sparring wars to prepare themselves for fights because they would destroy their body doing that. Well, and, and not just that, it's like some things, and I want to be careful with this too. It's like you were being careful with the way you said stuff a minute ago, because you have to be precise. I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Full mission profiles, wearing full kit, that has a value. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you never do that in your training, but the value is it's a test. Right. You know, that's how you're testing all the drill work you've done, all the skill work you've done, everything you did to build up to that test. Then you do the test and you evaluate where you're at and you go back and you go through the cycle again to get better. You're not getting better during the test. For people who will never uh, have the opportunity to do that, another way to look at that is competition shooting. So you go out and you know you go, you can train on the range. You're working drills, fundamentals, that sort of stuff, and you can put that all together at a club match. Because I'm not going to go and I'm not going to build ten stages to go shoot as my practice session. I might build a stage to shoot as my practice session to focus on certain things. And then I can go test myself in that club match and grade my performance yep. against other people who are trying just as hard as I am. Yeah. And then you get like efficient training in my opinion has a feedback loop to it. Mm -hmm. The test does have value. Right? Oh yeah. And for like your, your military and LE guys, like a, Stress shoots are a big thing. Like everybody loves like combining PT and shooting and making it really hard. That can have value as a test, but you're not building the skill during that. Right. So if your range sessions consist of nothing but that, you're going to have an artificial limit on the amount of skill you develop because that's not the most efficient way to develop skill. Well, and that makes a nice segue into something that we've talked about uh, on the phone before is the idea of stress and the idea of shooting proficiency being a way to mitigate externalized stress. So when we talk about training for environmental factors like the stress of dealing with competition stress or self-defense stress, um, the uh, military units that, I am, that I'm associated with like to do stress shoots as well. And I found on those stress shoots because of my level of skill shooting a handgun and a rifle i'm not even thinking about the shooting component of it i'm thinking about how many more stupid freaking burpees do i have to do before this is over can we get this over with oh god i gotta run another 50 meters like i'm not i'm we did one of these uh i would uh on my last deployment and i wasn't thinking about the shooting i was thinking about the burpees because i hate burpees and i'm wearing plates and i'm like this is fucking bullshit <laughs> But what that leads me around to is the idea that performance-based shooting, so if you train performance-based shooting in isolation from, you know, uh, military tactical training, from uh, SWAT, you know, tactical training, from even self-defense tactics like situational awareness and stuff like that, if you train performance-based shooting and you get good at shooting, what that gives you the ability to do is not think about shooting when you need to shoot. No, absolutely. And it's even um, even to dive a little deeper down the rabbit hole on that, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So like I was shooting with a, a SWAT team in Ohio yesterday and we talked about split speed, transition speed. Like these guys were asking me about how to up the speed on their shooting and we went through a few drills. And I was explaining to them that except for certain outlier situations, unless I'm forced to, I would never advocate splitting faster than about 0.25 in an actual real world engagement mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that your reaction time is about 0.2 if you're trained. So 0.25 gives you the ability to not make that next shot if now it's no longer a shot you should take. Right. Whereas if you're splitting at 0.17, you might be pulling that trigger one more time after you make the decision to not pull the trigger mm -hmm. because you, you can't catch up with the reaction speed. But what happens is people, people take that piece of data, which is, I think, an accurate piece of data, and they engineer things the wrong way. Now, in training, they're shooting at 0.25. Well, if you're shooting at the limit of your cognitive ability at 0.25, you're not getting the benefit that I'm talking about from slowing down the splits and shooting at 0.25. Mm -hmm. But if you're pulling splits, like say you're doing a build drill in training and you're pulling you know, 0.17, 0.16 on your splits. Now you're in the real world and you go back down to the 0.25, your processor speed that you built up in your brain, it's not taxed 
by that speed. Mm -hmm. So now mentally, that's a very relaxed pace for you. Now you can really pay attention to the process of shooting, but more than that, you can pay attention to everything else you need to pay attention to because the shooting is so easy now. Exactly. Whereas, whereas if that's the limit of your shooting ability, now your processor gets bogged down with that and it's hard for you to be aware of your environment and make the other decisions you have to make, I think. No, and that makes perfect sense. And it also, you know, goes along with what I've discussed with other people, what I've personally experienced as well, is that your brain, and, a, and I love this analogy when I'm teaching, especially military classes, I use this analogy a lot, but your brain is like Google Chrome. And everybody's had their Chrome browser open and they've had 733 tabs open and there's music coming from one of these tabs and they don't know which one it is <laughs> and everything's running really slow because the browser's overtaxed. Your brain functions the exact same way. It can't process a lot too much information and it'll start to shut down things that it doesn't think are important so the more that we can develop our shooting skill to the point where it becomes automatic and there's that word uh you know automatic or um unconscious competence right or, or don't they use automaticity for that too Isn't they that, do yeah. but i'm not smart enough to say that word without jacking it up so <laughs> the uh but that you know unconscious con or automaticity, that idea where if you have to, if you have spent all this time training to shoot your gun proficiently on the range, and then you have supplemented that training with, and from a civilian concealed carry standpoint, you've supplemented that training with learning how to recognize pre-fight indicators, you know, understanding how to be properly situationally aware on the street and stuff like that. That gives you the ability that when you have to react and produce your gun, you're not thinking, okay, clear my cover garment. One, two, three, front sight, trigger press. All of that happens automatically. Go back to the UFC analogy, right? That UFC fighter, his jab is subconscious. Mm -hmm. His decision to jab may be a conscious decision. It may be subconscious as well, based on what's going on and how he's reacting to cues he's built up through his training. But assume that it's a conscious decision, right? So he's thinking the guy has dropped his lead hand I have an opening for a jab. I'm going to jab him. Mm -hmm. He's not thinking, okay, I need to do this with my shoulder, this with my hip. I need to drive off my back foot. I need to clench my fist the right way. He's not thinking any of those things. Those are all subconscious. Right. He's done that jab 10,000 times. It's yep. like the old, uh, uh, the old Bruce Lee quote, which I'm very fond of, is I'm not afraid of the man who's practiced – Ten, you know, 10,000 kicks. I'm afraid of the man who's practiced one kick 10,000 times because he knows how to throw that kick. Um, and that actually, to segue into that, so when did you start getting, you started getting heavy into competition shooting while you're still on the SWAT team, right? I did. So I had been uh, advised to compete from some friends of mine for a long time, and I hadn't done it. I, I'm a stubborn guy. So... I, I always SWAT cop yeah, never. Yeah, no, no, never. Right. So here's basically how this worked. Right. So because I was NSF, I was exposed to a lot of the things that they had brought from the competition world into the special operations world because they've always mm -hmm. trained with the top shooters. So I was to the best of my ability before I competed. You can't really do it until you compete. But as much as you can approximate it, I was training a lot like a competitor before I even competed. Mm hmm. Then for a while, I was resisting the competition because of the whole, you know, the old, the old argument, you know, the, the martial artist versus the gamesman, that whole bit, right? And it wasn't that I didn't think competition was valuable. It was more of a priority of my training time at that point in my life. Sure. Um, and then I was exposed to guys like my buddy, Frank Proctor, who was a Safal constructor for 20th Group, and realized that. Yeah, basically my argument didn't hold water because I was comfortably competent around my peers in SF, except for guys who competed like Frank. Mm -hmm. Those were the guys that I couldn't I couldn't even cl come close to staying up with. So I realized there was something to it. Then after that, it was just a function of knowing myself. Um, I actually, I knew I was going to start competing for probably two or three years before I did. And the reason I didn't was because I had a young son and my life wasn't set up to where I could kind of dive all in. Sure. And I, and I know myself. I didn't want to do it part way. So I trained like I'd always trained and I worked on things for competition for a bit before actually starting. And then I started and pretty much true to my personality. There was no, you know, 
there was no ramp up. It was just straight on full blast. Let's go all the way. Yep, pretty much. Now, and I, I know what the answer to this is because we talked about it before, but uh, how did that affect your, you know, things that you were doing professionally, like CQB and stuff like that? Yeah, see, this was really cool because I did not expect this. So here's how it went, right? At first, I thought competition was going to help me become, you know, a better shooter for just the mechanical skill of shooting. Right. Like we talked about before, which makes sense. And I wasn't expecting it to really benefit anything else. It was just going to be that. And, and actually, initially, I did really well with, with classifiers, but not so well with field courses and, and matches. Sure. So, so as I was getting seriously into it, I decided I wanted to actually start doing well in matches. <laughs> you know, not just, be, not just be a master class shooter on paper, but actually perform like one. Right. So I started looking at it as my, my sport, my, you know, the thing I was competing in. Not expecting to get more benefit than I'd already gotten for work from it. Like I didn't expect any more benefit than what I'd already gotten as far as my shooting ability. Because my shooting had gotten much better very quickly once I started competing. So I started working on movement skills and breaking down stages. And I started really looking at the data. I want to circle back around to that in a minute because I think data is something that's really vital. Like there's yeah, absolutely. Things to say there. So I really worked hard on the actual gamesmanship, right? I'm being a gamer. I, I worked hard on it, on walking the stages, on the visualization, on getting better at movement, on some things that I was exposed to about my shooting itself that I had to fix, kind of fixing the engine for the race car. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to drive the race car faster. And none of this I thought would carry over to work. I thought I'd already gotten the benefits for work I was going to get. What I discovered, though, and it was a, as much a surprise to me as I think it would have been to anyone else, was that the better I got at USPSA, the better I got at CQB. Hmm. And this wasn't because they're similar, because they're not. You're, you're, when you shoot a stage, it is not tactical. You're no. shooting a drill. You're trying to do as quick as you can. You're trying to shave off time every place possible. It's not a fight. It's a shooting drill. It sure isn't. And I really didn't expect that to give me any benefit to my CQB, but I found that I was getting huge benefits, and it was for a couple reasons. One is that I was now looking at movement with a gun in my hand like an athlete. So even though the movement styles are different, even though the desired end state is a bit different between CQB and shooting a match. I was evaluating how to be efficient in my movement down to thousands of a second because thousands of a second matter. Right. I mean, for crying out loud, if you're at nationals, if you're 10% ahead of someone else, that's a huge stomping. I mean, oh, it's, it's unbelievable. It, yeah. The percentages are so tight, so close. So like every thousandth of a second matters. And what that did for my CQB was I started looking at how we flowed through the structure and not changing the goals of the movement, but making the movements more efficient, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not about being fast for CQB. The pace is usually actually pretty, even in dynamic CQB, the pace is much more sedate than people think for mm -hmm. the most part, for the most part. Every, uh, it's funny you mentioned that every time that we have gone through, uh, that we get shooters who go through CQB courses, which are mandatory for my, uh, job in the air force. The thing that the instructors 100% of the time will say to new shooters is slow down. Yeah. Because yep. everybody sees Hollywood CQB, which is very fast. And they're like, well, I clearly want to go at that pace. When in reality, the pace is, as you said, much, 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 much slower than yep. what you see, what you're kind of expect from it. You know, and there are outliers where you have. Of to, course. But that's a different thing, different topic. But it's not about being faster. It's about being sooner, right? Mm -hmm. So like take an example, say, uh, say you're the number one guy going into a center fed room and I don't want to get too much into tactics on an open forum, but you know, right. everybody, everybody I think knows you got to hit the corner, right? Yes. So what most people do is in their mind, they're hitting that corner immediately, but because they're not looking at this like an athlete, what they're actually doing is stepping into the room and swinging towards the corner with a bit of, you know, a bit of a sense of urgency, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you set up properly with your footwork and with the weapon, the first thing that breaks that threshold can be the muzzle in your eye. Mm -hmm. So it's little things like that. And it's, it, there's a lot of little subtleties to it, but I really started changing the footwork and the weapons manipulations for my guys 
not in some drastic sense of, oh, now the CQB has got different principles. That's not it at all. No. It's making it much more efficient for doing the same thing we were doing before. It's just doing it in an efficient way, doing it the right way. And then the other benefit, which is a little more esoteric, but I think is even more valuable, is there's a perceptual thing. Like we talk about that processor speed in your brain that you right. build up through shooting. So shooting stages, shooting matches, shooting, you know, a club match every week, right, for an extended period of time, shooting major matches, you get attenuated. Your brain gets attenuated to that faster pace. You know, it's like when you're when you're just starting to compete and you watch a guy shoot an El Prez, you know, and you watch like a, a Ben Stager or a Bob Vogel shoot an El Prez, and you can't even see in the beginning how they could see their sights. Right, you, you like, blink like, and it's over. Yeah, it's like, what, what just happened, right? But I guarantee you, Ben and Bob are watching that sight track on mm. every shot. Your brain gets acclimatized to that pace. So what happens then for CQB, what happened for me, is the world got slower. It's not even like I got faster. It's like everything else Everything else kind of slows down. Everything else got slower, yep. So... You go in, and when you're used to thousands of a second, but now the CQB pace, like I said, what makes it overwhelming for the bad guys is the teamwork and the fact that it, everybody's got their piece of the puzzle, and the bad guy has too many choices. Mm -hmm. right? So no individual good guy, unless things are going wrong, has to move very fast. So when you're going through, and you're going through the structure, at that pace, when you're used to running through a 32-round field course as fast as you possibly can, now you're not taxed. Mm -hmm. Your perceptual awareness isn't taxed. Your cognitive speed isn't taxed. The cognitive load is low for you. You don't have too many windows open like you talked about a minute ago. Right. right. And now it is so much easier for you to pay attention to everything else. What I found was that my world opened up more than it was before. And it was already opened up compared to my younger teammates who didn't have the experience I had. Like my world had already opened up through just exposure. Mm -hmm. Right. But now all of a sudden, it was like I turned the volume up on the exposure I was getting. So when I turned the volume back down for work, it took even less effort. Right. Now that makes, per I mean, and that makes perfect sense because what you've developed again is that ability to process things faster. And there's a very interesting uh, study that I read from the Harvard Medical Group, which is relevant to this. And it's talking about stress. And the reason why it's relevant here is they basically came to the conclusion and their examples were uh breakup stress versus the stress of about to get into a car crash and your brain doesn't know the difference all right it says oh god this is terrible stress i'm going to have these you know six chemical responses regardless and what they saw as in this study was that the person's ability to have a measured reaction to that stress was based on their exposure, you know, prior exposure to it, train, you know, levels of training and stuff like that. Like the race car driver had a really bad reaction to the breakup st stress, but to the impending car crash, he was just kind of like, here we go again. Yep. Yep. There's another car crash. Exactly. And so, and that's kind of the thing is that when you acclimatize your brain to operating and making choices and seeing things under stress, it gets better at doing that under all other kinds of stress, regardless if the environmental circumstances are different. Now, that doesn't mean that a USPSA shooter is going to be a super duper gunfighter, but it does mean that if you take a really good USPSA shooter and put them in a CQB class and train them, they will be able to solve the shooting problem of CQB and focus on developing the tactical and discipline side of CQB. There's actually, there's an example. I'm not going to use the guy's name because he's actually in the pipeline for special forces right now, but a uh, master class shooter out of Ohio, really good guy. Um, he was a USPSA master class shooter long before he joined the army. Mm -hmm. And he just felt like he wanted to serve. So he's, he might be through the Q course now. I haven't talked to him in a month or two, but he did some CQB training prior to signing up with some of the top names from soft that are now training in the civilian mm -hmm. world. And I believe it was Chuck Pressburg. I think it was Chuck that said that, uh, he was the easiest person he's ever had to teach CQB to. Because we're talking about a guy who's, even though he was a master class shooter, he still was like top 10 carry optics at nationals. 
So he's, right. like, he's a really he's good He's really shooter. good. Really good. Yeah, he should be a GM. He might be a GM now. So Chuck said that he was the easiest student he ever had to teach CQB to. And the reason is because he moved like an athlete with a gun. He had the cognitive speed. He was used to evaluating an environment in thousands of a second with a firearm in his hand and engaging things. Well, and that is, to me, for, you know, and again, I try to focus, despite my, you know, despite being in the military still, and that I try to focus a lot of my content on civilians and, you know, right. civilian self-defense. And the for me, and the thing that I repeatedly beat the drum that I'm always on about competition, the biggest benefit for competition for Joe CCW is exactly that, is it enhances your processor speed, and it gets you used to the phrase that uh, that a friend of mine used, it gets used to problem solving with a gun in your yep. hand. You yep. know, and when you're solving a problem with a gun in your hand, all of a sudden you get better at you get better at all the things we've talked about, and that does give me. Oh, go ahead. No, I don't mean to cut you off, but it's just funny, and uh, I'm going to kind of I'm going to wrap myself out here a little bit, to my students. So, the last part of the second day of my pistol class, I do stages with the students mm -hmm. for those reasons. I mean, it's these guys are mostly guys that carry a gun as opposed to competitors, right? right? Whether they're law enforcement, military, or civilians who do CCW. But for those same reasons you talked about, I'm exposing them to stages. I don't call them stages because I don't want guys like, you know, shying away from it because of the competitive nature. Mm -hmm. So I call them shooting problems. I love it. I love it. Um, a friend of mine who teaches down here, uh, John Dufresne, he calls them uh, scenarios. You know, mm -hmm. when he sets them up, he's like, all right, so here's your scenario that we're going to use. And then he uses a shot timer and keeps track of everybody's score. And I'm like, you're a yep. sneaky little bastard. But and and that's the thing. And to kind of also wrap around to something else we talked about is – you know, another great reason to do that is to get these guys used to moving athletically with a gun because one of the things that drives me nuts, and it's something that a lot of people that I talk to drives them nuts too, about the firearms industry is this idea that is it's deeply entrenched in firearms training that somehow human physiology changes when I'm holding a gun in my hands. And I don't know where that idea came from, but if I had a time machine, I would go back in time and I'd beat the shit out of the guy who had that idea to begin with. If I if I hear one more person tell me that you've got to go over the top of the slide because gross motor skill, I swear oh, to God. God. You know, and it's funny because no one in – this is – and here's one of the problems that I legitimately have is – my circle and your circle of people that we interact with in the firearms community is very high level, you know? So Scott Jedlinski doesn't talk about gross motor skills and Chuck Pressburg doesn't talk about power stroking the slide and stuff like that because these guys all know how to shoot really, really well. You know, you can make an argument for uh, the I use the slide as an example. You can make a logical argument for, using the slide because it works regardless of whatever weapon system that you have. It's not going to be dependent on hand position or thumb position or things like that. And here's a sidebar. I hope everybody who advocates for Israeli carry hears this. Fun fact. The reason why the Israeli carry system was invented was because when the Israeli army was first stood up back in 47 or 48, they had a hodgepodge of handguns. They didn't have one, one standardized, standard issue handgun, so they needed a system of drawing and getting the weapon into action that worked regardless of the gun that an individual soldier had. So that's why they went with chamber empty carry. And now – as you well know about things getting buried in institutions, yeah. since they've been doing it for 70 years, it's still here, you know? But that's just a fun factoid for people who still think it's a good idea. It's not. It's stupid. Load your guns, people. But to get back to the the gross motor thing is – so and you, you mentioned uh, actually the whole reason why I was like I should do an interview with Matt was you had a post on Instagram where you were doing sh suicides – which for people who haven't played sports yeah. is you run back and forth from point A to point B, but you were stopping at point B and shooting, stopping at point A at shooting. And you mentioned that the body doesn't change just because you're shooting a gun. It, it's The body works the way it works. It's not any different because there's a gun in your hand. And everybody wants to treat it like it's somehow it, – it's like martial arts in the 80s is what it's like. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's – well, you know – you should move like a crane. 
dude, you're not a crane. I have never been a crane. You're not a crane. Don't move like a crane. Don't move like a tiger. Don't move, you know, move like Caleb. <laughs> right. Like, move, move like your Matt. Body's move like Matt. To move. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, and, go ahead. And like, that's the other thing too, is like you get caught up in, and there's something else that, not at the high level in the firearms community, but like at the, the local level, it seems like we really are kind of paralleling the way the martial arts world was like right around the time of the first couple of UFCs. Hmm. Like I, that's kind of where we're at. Right. And there's this affectation for exaggerated technique. And you see it in the older martial arts world too, before, you know, the UFC stuff was as, was overwhelmingly popular like it is now. Right. Hmm. Technique shouldn't be an affectation. You it shouldn't be this exaggerated thing, you know, that because it looks cool or it looks crisp or it looks sharp, you know, it's, Do you remember it's after not, the, the Magpul videos came out and everyone was like launching yeah, their magazines yes, into yes. space. That's yeah. the, immediately what I thought of when you started talking about this and that's no slight on the Magpul guys. You know, it's, it's the, just, yeah, it's, and I think it's a phase that our pursuit kind of went through. Mm-hmm. Or is going through now, and I think it's all going to sort itself out. And I, that actually comes back around to the data thing. I'd love to get back onto that. Yeah, absolutely. But like, you look at the top guys at anything, right? And let's take a couple different examples. Let's take uh, we'll take a couple shooters. We'll go we'll go back to Bob and and Ben. Okay, okay. we'll use those as the shooting examples. Um, UFC, pick me two, pick two vastly different physical types for UFC for me. Daniel uh, Cormier and uh, Tony Ferguson. All right, so vastly different physical types, right? Yeah. Their technique doesn't look the same. No. Bob Vogel's technique does not look anything like Ben Stager's. It really doesn't, and you couldn't have no. picked better examples for that. Bob has that extremely yep. uh, canted grip. He looks like his forearms are made out of rebar that someone wrapped together. Uh, and then Ben, for people who don't know, he stands very casually. He's, his yep. entire posture is erect. It barely looks like he's holding on to the gun, but obviously he's doing something right. So their techniques follow the same principles. They look different because their physiognomy and their psychology are different. They're not violating the rules. Mm -hmm. They're using the principles in the way that best suits their mind and their body. And that's what top level athletes do, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with the UFC fighters. You know, like they're using the principles the same way. It's gonna be expressed differently because they're built differently. Like I'm, I'm 6'3 and 235. I'm gonna look different than Tim Heron shooting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's that's a really good example too, because I was having a conversation with a, a, a well-known fi well-known firearms instructor talking about one of the things that I teach in all of my classes is I teach stance. So I build like when I teach like your basic class, uh, I start everything and I build it from the ground up. Um, one of the things I do for the Air Force for people who don't know, I'm an Air Force combat arms instructor, which isn't combat arms like the army. It just means I teach people how to shoot. So I've got a class full of nurses and C-130 pilots who need to learn how to shoot an M9, right? Great. I start front there the same as your basic students. We start from the ground up and we teach. And I am a huge believer in teaching stance because I'm five foot six and I weigh 165 pounds. I need to use stance as part of the integrated act of firing to control recoil. If you're <coughs> Steve Fisher, <coughs> Uh, maybe you don't need to use stance as much because you're the size of a fucking mountain gorilla. Yep. Yeah, I I mean, I'm built like an orangutan. I'm a missing exactly. link. I, I barely have opposable thumbs. <laughs> I'm really not quite sure how I can write, to tell you the truth. They, they don't really, like, they don't really oppose. My it's... hands look like an ape's hands. <laughs> <laughs> but, and that's, and to your point about, you know, physiology and how that affects shooting none of us are doing anything differently we're not you know we're not teaching sights or trigger or you know anything really differently than anybody else but we're understanding that my body you know i played uh baseball in high school i uh fought amateur taekwondo all the way up through college uh the way my body moves and acts the only things about it that have changed are due to external damage like my knees aren't so great anymore but Nothing about that has changed in 25 years. 
I got an example actually from my own shooting because this is something that's come up in conversation a few times. All right, so I think this comes from my martial arts background. My draw, I have a really fast draw, but my draw looks like it's got extra movement in it. It's almost mm. like a punch. It's almost like a punching dynamic. Like my hips snap like a punch. Interesting. I would never recommend that anyone do that. Right. Like it's not. It's. It is technically wasted effort. It's technically mm. wasted movement. I think it's just kind of in my hardwiring from so many years of punching, and it doesn't seem to hurt my shooting. So I haven't tried to get rid of it. Right. Um, I do try to kind of keep it under control, trying to keep it from getting any more than it already is. And I'm trying to make it a little a little more subtle, but it will probably always be there just because it's kind of where my, the way my skill was raised, was taught, was brought up. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's an interesting point too, is because, you know, we all have like an idealized form that we would like to get to with our shooting, right? Like I would love to shoot more like uh, Ben or Max Michelle with a very, you know, head up, very vertical posture, you know, not craning my neck or anything like that. And while I do not do the full tactical turtle where my chin is around my nipples, uh, if you watch videos, anytime I'm shooting fast, like if I'm trying to do a bill drill or something like that, there's definitely a little bit more shoulder roll and a little bit more head engagement than I necessarily would like. But also I shot a 197 bill drill. So I'm like, I'm not too worried about the suboptimal thing that I'm doing. Now, with that in mind, those are also things that are fixable. You can, um, I spent a long time in dry fire working on fixing my draw from a retention holster because my reten my draw out of a retention holster was crap. And I spent a lot of time going from hands here just to grabbing the holster and defeating the retention mechanism. And that was it. So for people out there who have a hitch in their draw or ha are doing something mechanically you don't like, you can fix that but it takes a lot of time and a lot of reps, like a lot of time and a lot of reps. And it's the longer you've been doing something, the more work it takes to undo it. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of truth to the, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. All right, sidebar. Sorry. Yes. I think that, and this goes far beyond just shooting skill, our self-defense, our any preparedness far beyond that, just for living, just for life. The more plastic you stay, as far as your brain goes, the more you are willing to always be learning and changing and experimenting, the longer you will stay mentally young. I really strongly believe that. So I think like you just, you know, take away the benefits for whether you're a tactical athlete or whether you're a CCW guy or whether you're a competitive shooter, take away the benefits for your pursuit. Like even just take that off the table, your quality of life will remain better if you keep learning, keep changing, Absolutely. keep growing. I think. No, sidebar. I. That's uh, it's a that's a sidebar that I absolutely agree with, and there's a big reason why I think it's important if you are in one of those, you know, with that in mind, if you're in one of those niches, like let's say you are, I. I, I, I don't really lean on any of the military experience that I have or anything like that. It's great. It's a fun job. I get to teach people how to shoot, right? Like I'm not ever going to complain about that, but my lane has always been competition shooting, you know, and, but the big value for me is to have experiences and talk to people and hang out with people who are outside of that lane. People like you, you know, who come from a special forces background, stuff like that, because that means I get to think about stuff in a context I never would have thought about it before. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, well, that makes a lot of fucking sense. Maybe we should do things differently in this setting. And, you know, whether you're a competition shooter or a tactical shooter or you've never been to a class, hanging out with people who think differently about shooting than you will make you, it will keep you mentally young and it will probably make you a better shooter at some yep. point too. Yep. Well, and it's, and this will circle back around to data. I'm still going to circle back around to that. Yeah, right? let's do the data conversation right now then. So the thing about this is that the more data you have, the better off you are, right? The more viewpoints you have, the better off you are. Mm -hmm. And if you want to truly be good at something, and this is the, one of the things that so many people fall foul of throughout their lifetime, you can't ever be fixated. Go back to the martial arts analogy. Go back to Bruce Lee, right? You know, you can't fixate on something. It can't become static. It can't become dead. It has to mm -hmm. stay alive. 
your shooting has to stay alive. If you're not always evaluating what makes it better, then you're not growing. And there's no stasis. There's no steady state. That doesn't exist in nature. You're either improving or you're degrading, one or the other. So I think that that is vital for any pursuit, but especially for shooting. And the cool thing about shooting, speaking like from the martial arts background, right? You want to be a good martial artist and shooting is a martial art as far as I'm concerned, but like say, you know, something else, you want to be a good Thai boxer, right? So you can get some subjective feedback. You don't get a lot of objective feedback. No, you don't. Right? Because back to technique. My grip looks different than your grip, looks different than Vogel's grip, looks different than Steger's grip, looks different than Proctor's grip, right? The physical appearance of the grip is not what makes it a good grip. What makes it a good grip are the things that are going on that you cannot see from the outside, Mm -hmm. unless you have a truly educated eye. Imitating the way someone else's hands are physically placed on the gun is not duplicating their grip. You see what I mean? Absolutely. So back to the whole martial arts thing, especially before we had these open forums like the UFC, where we could just kind of see what works and what doesn't, when everything was much more insular and you know much more contained within its own organization, there wasn't a lot of objective feedback. People tried to emulate the way someone's technique looked. That's not emulating what makes that technique good necessarily, right? Mm-hmm. How do I know that I have, we'll go back to the jab. How do I know that I have a good jab? I mean, I can tell that it looks fast. I can't shot time my jab. No. Sounds good Um, when it hits the bag, I guess. Yeah. You know, if you're sparring with somebody or if you're in a fight with someone and the jab works, that's great. Your jab worked on that guy at that time. Mm -hmm. There's so many variables, so many factors. It's hard to say if it's getting, if your jab's getting better, if your jab's getting worse, how good your jab actually is. Right. Right. You know that it worked for you there. And that's where a lot of the tactical shooting community still kind of is because they're not collecting all the data. Mm -hmm. It's getting better. It's getting a lot better than it used to be for sure. But think about this. Unlike other martial pursuits, you can literally collect every single piece of data for shooting. Mm -hmm. If you have a smartphone and you have Coach's Eye, our shot coach from Max Michelle, and you've got a shot timer and you have targets, you literally have every piece of data. You can examine Mm -hmm. everything down to the thousandth of a second and figure out objectively what's better. Like with that information, you can say, all right, I know that if I move my hand here and draw this way, it takes 0.10 off my draw. And you know that you can say, if I look at the target and then move my gun into my eye line and interrupt that vision, my splits get faster because I see the sights before, because I see the target and the sights and I know exactly when I can start shooting. And with that data, the best thing about that data that applies, whether you're a competition shooter, a CCW guy, or a administrator for a law enforcement agency is you can now make data driven decisions instead of emotional decisions. And that's one of my biggest pet peeves because i love data too because data answers questions you know when people say i like this gun because it feels better or i reload this way because it feels better and i'm like i don't give a fuck about your feelings man tell me what the data says and like well i don't have a shot timer because i'm training for the real world and i'm like listen just because People don't bring shot timers to gunfights doesn't mean that there isn't a timer. It's just you can't hear when it starts, and you also don't know when it's going to stop. Yeah. So, like, going back to that, right, what I used to always tell people, because I would get that kind of pushback sometimes, and I would just, like, say, guys on the SWAT team, right? I'm like, okay, so uh, my prior service guys, what's the cyclic rate on an AK-47? And somebody would know the answer. I'm like, okay, so now take that 800 and whatever it is rounds per minute, divide it down. How many rounds is that per second? (laughs) I feel like a lot. Yeah. I'm like, so tell me again how much time matters in a gunfight. Right. Well, my favorite are the guys, like, you can always tell too, you know, uh, that. The people who have never, you know, people are like, oh, let's say there's no timers in a gunfight and going fast doesn't really matter. I'm like, 
these are all the people you can also tell that have never been in a situation where being fast mattered, you know, because, uh, and I'm not sure who said this one originally. I, there's, you know, for, I, I am collecting my list of responses to when people haul out tired cliches, like no timers in a gunfight and stuff like that. Because one of my favorites is, well, speed is a tactic. Like going fast is, uh, there's a reason why, you know, people say speed, surprise and violence of actions are great ways to win fights. Cause they are. So, I mean, I can understand a bit of the logic, although sure. it's flawed. And it's like, here's the thing. Like, here's a, you know who Musashi was? Miyamoto yeah, Musashi? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So he talked about how speed, objective speed, isn't the point. Mm -hmm. The point is the timing. Yeah. All right. That is true. So modern martial artist, who was the first guy to really talk about timing? Bruce first, Lee. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce Lee was fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he wasn't fast because just the objective speed was the point. He was fast because the best way to get that broken rhythm and to capture the opponent's timing is to be fast. So you're saying that speed allows you to dictate the timing as yes. opposed to reacting to someone else's timing? <gasps> yes. No. What a shocker that is. That so is what... Like, like, here's another one I like to say. So gunfight's a compound word, right? Mm -hmm. Which one of those two words is the operative word in gunfight? Well, obviously, it's gun, right? Because we're here to talk about guns. Yeah, it's fight. Absolutely. <laughs> it's fight. So the ability to be fast enables you to control the fight, mm -hmm. to capture the other person's timing to win the fight. It's like guys like to talk about how having a super fast draw isn't that important. It might be. Well, here's the thing, right? So in a lot of situations, if you are tactically aware, your draw speed no longer becomes part of the problem. A lot of times, right? That's true. That's absolutely true. If you're on top of your game, you're looking at what's going on in the world around you, you can kind of cheat it by being ready for the fight, which is smart. Having said that, you may never need a blindingly fast draw from concealment. But if you do need it, you're really going to need it. Yeah, absolutely. When it's this idea that a lot of people have, uh, that I'm obviously a big fan of, it's something that a lot of people that I know teach. And it's interestingly something that I stole a little bit of from like the air combat maneuvering school is the idea of making the other guy react to you instead of you reacting to the other guy. And let's you in that civilian CCW context, let's say you're, you're managing unknown context and your situational awareness failed and you have to react to the other guy initially, just using a fast draw as an example, a fast draw that this guy's not prepared for now changes that situation and it makes him reactionary. So you've done your reaction. You did something he wasn't prepared for at a speed. He wasn't expecting it. Now he's on the reactionary end of things and you have an advantage. And not even just that. So all fighting, when you get right down to it, all fighting is mental. It's Absolutely. all psychological. You're imposing your will on an opponent through the use of a medium, whatever that medium is. Hands, feet, firearms. F-16s. Yeah, thermonuclear devices, right? Whatever it is. When you do something like a fast, practiced, competent draw, you are now psychologically putting pressure on the other person. Mm -hmm. When you obviously know what you are doing, <laughs> when you are comfortable there, they're going to be less comfortable there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, and that's, yeah, that's, that's, I can't think of a better way to wrap up the skills part of this uh, podcast. I did want to ask you before we end. Uh, so you're working with STI right now, right? Uh, what are you doing for yep. those guys? Well, so we are doing a bunch of stuff with them, actually. We've got myself, um, Mike Pannone, and Drew Estelle, Bear Solutions and CTT Solutions. We're doing a lot of stuff with military and law enforcement with them, going around and like, you know, demoing the firearms to different agencies. STI is going to have their own branded training classes that they'll offer agencies that buy the firearm. Tight. So we're going to be doing that as well. Um, Mike is actually working on the POI for that, which is which is pretty cool. It's Mike Pannone. Right. Um, 
it's it's a great it's a great thing that I'm going around. I'm seeing all these different law enforcement agencies, all these different SWAT teams, getting to shoot with them, getting to to expose them to the firearm. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. I really like it, and I'm a real big believer in the product. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just nice. It's it's a good gig. That's awesome, man. Uh, where can people find your stuff online if they're looking? Okay, so. Well, back to the STI thing, right? So if anybody wants a demo of the guns for their agency, they can reach out to me. And they can reach out to me the same way they reach out to me for my company. It's fine. So I'm not giving out too much contact info. Um, and I can definitely set that up for them. I can help them set up a and e I can do all those things. We can get training scheduled. For my stuff, I've got my company is Greybeard Actual. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook as that. My website is graybeardactual.com. You can reach me through any three of those mechanisms, and I'll get right back to you. Um, I've got open enrollment classes that, you know, once the the stay at home thing is lifted, we'll be rolling throughout the rest of the year. Fingers crossed. And I've got a bunch of agency stuff too. If anybody wants uh, an agency class, they can reach out to me and I can set that up. Um, open enrollment stuff is pretty much scheduled out. We're starting to schedule for 2021 already. So they can reach out to me and we can get that going too. Awesome. Matt, it was great to talk to you. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to link up in person, drink some whiskey, smoke some cigars, maybe at SHOT Show next year. Oh, we got to do it before then, man. We got to get together and shoot. Sounds like a plan, man. Maybe right, uh, I'm actually down in Florida for PCC Nationals in June, man. We ought to try to hook up. Ooh. You know what? That sounds like a plan. Matt, it's been great talking to you. Take care. Uh, for the listeners out there, guys, we appreciate it. If you want to support what we're doing, bringing more guests on like Matt and stuff like that, you can uh, just send me an envelope full of money. Uh, that's fine. I don't do Patreon. I'll give you a post office box. Thanks for listening, everyone.